tune in to the podcast and subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Souls of Many. Welcome to the SOM podcast. This is your host, Bridget Chapman Lewis. Today, we'll be tackling a very um, difficult and challenging topic, racism. I've got a great panel of guests, and I will introduce those guests to you. I am proud of the work that we are doing. I'm proud of this initiative, and I'm really excited to have this conversation about racism. It is very difficult to talk about things that we push in the corner, but this one doesn't seem to be budging. It's that one ton gorilla that's in the room that won't go anywhere. So today we're going to talk about it and enlighten you all on it. And I thank you, audience, for joining. Let me start with Chuck. Chuck's married to Allison. He's uh, got a son, two grandchildren. He was born in Roseland and raised in Riverdale, and that's in the Chicagoland area. He attended high school at Thornton Harvey, 1975, and served in the U.S. Navy as a data systems technician, petty officer, third class. Thanks for your service, Chuck. He served as a village trustee in Riverdale. He's the writer of a column titled Brain Drizzle for a small market periodical in the North Woods of Wisconsin. He's retired after 38 years working for the combined companies of Hewlett Packard as an engineering technical support manager. And he has an MBA from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He strongly believes in the idea of lifelong learning and equality of opportunity. We've got Samuel Crane. Sam is a 25-year-old business owner from Chicago who grew up in London, England. His current projects include Trip Seed Media, which is a local media and consulting company, as well as an online poetry community based out of San Francisco called Just Words. He is in the process of publishing his first book of poetry, which should be available in late 2021. Welcome, Sam. Thank we've you. Got, we've got Sue Johnson, Susanna Dozen. Sue, I hope I did your name justice. I'm not quite sure. She's a immigrant by ethnicity. She's Serbian Orthodox born and raised in Nikola Tesla's town in Croatia. Her background includes pre-law, marketing, and real estate. She's a mother of two children and truly enjoys being of service to others. Welcome, Sue. We also have with us Michael Hurst, and I'm going to have you, Michael, introduce yourself. Do the honors. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for giving the opportunity. Uh, Bridget, uh, we go back to our uh, Maywood days. I uh, grew up in uh, Maywood, which is a western suburb of Chicago. Still live in the uh, western suburb of Chicago, live in Naperville now. I uh, am fortunate enough to be the pastor of the greatest church in the world, New Horizon Christian Fellowship, the place where heaven meets earth in the Fox Valley villages of Aurora, Illinois. Uh, we are uh, celebrating our uh, 24th year uh, of, of ministry. Um, I went to uh, St. Joe High School in Westchester, uh, graduated from Southern University with an accounting degree in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. That is a HBCU, uh, Historically Black College University. I am a member of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, and I believe all great men are alphas, uh, Martin Luther King, Thurgood Marshall, just to name a few. Um, but again, uh, you know, I'm a husband uh, of uh, 31 years. I have a uh, uh, three children and uh, three grandchildren present, one on the way as I speak. Excellent. That's a full life, Mike. <laughs> I love yeah. it. I love it. So I want to tell everyone on the panel, if anybody gets out of hand, I've got a pastor here to redeem you. And I've got Chuck who, who totes his guns. He's coming for you. So pipe down. Keep it good. <laughs> All right. Just joking with you guys. Um, I'd like to open up by reading um, the definition of racism and what it actually is, according to Oxford Dictionary. And it's as such, 
prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against a person or people on the basis of the membership of their membership of a particular racial or ethnic group, typically one that is a minority or marginalized. And then Miriam Webster um, gave some 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 names and adjectives to what racism really is. And it's pretty long, but I'm not going to read it all. But uh, some of the things that typify racism, according to Miriam Webster, is microaggressions, police profiling, etc., systemic oppression of a racial group to the social, economic, and political advantage of another. Um, it talks about white supremacy, redlining, et cetera, and it goes on with a lot of jargon. Um, so that's just two uh, sources um, defining racism. But as we tackle this uh, topic on a broader scale and then bring it into a micro level, I'm going to get feedback from everyone um, as to what they really think racism is. How would you define racism? But before we get to that, I received an article from Chuck, and I thought it was one of the most well-crafted um, pieces of work I've seen to date on this topic and what a person believes as to what's going on at our society at large. Um, and I'm going to have Chuck read that to you because I think it's just absolutely beautiful to open up our dialogue. I appreciate that, Bridget. Absolutely. Uh, it is difficult to have a conversation about where we are heading today as a society when you find that no one is listening. Our values and our cultures have always been changing, but now they're changing at an accelerating rate. What once was a dialogue about what we believe as a nation has become a monologue. I can no longer continue to sit back and listen to ideas that seem to be accepted by some as fact, which I do not personally believe. I wanted to get this on the record so that one day my grandchildren can look back at this, read it, and clearly understand where their pops stood during these days of tumult and chaos. Hopefully we can again get back to a place where we can share our own personal beliefs. To be clear, I am not a racist, even though I am white. I do not believe in systemic racism. It is difficult to have a common understanding of that term as it has been so inconsistently defined. I believe that hatred toward any race is racism. I believe there are racists in the country, but I do not believe that we live in a racist nation. I believe that black lives do matter. So do white lives, along with any other race you can put in front of, lives matter. I believe that peace comes through strength, not weakness. I have no difficulty in admitting that I cling to my guns and my Bible. I strongly support the police, firefighters, military, and first responders. I believe that our country owes everyone equality of opportunity, capitalism, but not equality of outcome, socialism. I stand for the flag and kneel for our God. I swore an oath in 1975 as I joined the Navy that I still support to this day. I, Charles Boucher, do solemnly swear I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I'm not going to read all of that. I believe in and hope for the vision of Martin Luther King. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created. And when this happens, and when we allow freedom to ring, we will let it ring from every village and every hamlet, every state and every city. We will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children Black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and the words of the old Negro spirit, God Almighty, we are free at last. Beautiful. 
Beautiful. I really enjoyed reading that article, Chuck, coming from a different perspective. And I think that the panel might be able to appreciate it one way or the other. So at this time, I'd like to go around the table, so to speak, and get additional feedback from the panel. And just let's define racism. What do you think racism is, Sam? Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I enjoyed that article immensely, Chuck. Uh, uh, really appreciated it. Um, I think r- racism to me um, comes in, in so very many forms. Uh, and I, I have sort of a unique perspective as I, I spent most of my smaller child years in London, um, where they, they teach race and talk about race very differently. Um, so I see it as, as sort of a spectrum. Um, you talked about microaggressions. There are, there is micro racism, uh, and I, I can see this in my own self when I'm walking back from the bank and I see some uh, youths on the side of the street and there's a, there's a part of my soul that says I should cross the street. You know, I should get off of the side. That's micro racism in my mind. And then there's the, the macro racism, which is, um, you know, shouting racial slurs at people and, and that sort of thing. Um, in, in the very same way, I think there's um, overt racism um, through the system. And I also think there's subvertive racism. Uh, when you talk about redlining, I would consider that um, sort of subvertive racism. Uh, uh, when you talk about um, black kids being sentenced to uh, being tried as adults far more often than uh, white children of the same age, I would consider that subvertive racism. Um, but then there's your overt racism um, that we all saw with Martin Luther King, where uh, the governor is blocking the entrance to the school and <laughs> things like that. That's overt racism. That doesn't happen so much anymore. Um, these days, uh, the battles are much more subversive, which I think is uh, what Chuck, and correct me if I'm wrong, was trying to say as far as the definition changes so much um, as far as what systemic racism is. And I think that's because it's very camouflaged. Um, well, well done <laughs> in a certain respect. Um, So that would be my definition. Okay. Uh, Thank you for that, Sam. But I want to come back to you because um, you hit on something in the UK in that you're taught certain things and it's a little bit different than here. So I want to circle back to you, but thank you for for that commentary. Let's move on to you, Michael. What is racism to you? How would you define it? So when you look at the word uh, prejudice, it means to uh, to prejudge. And I think we all are guilty of prejudging people by their externals. Um, um, But racism to me is when I prejudge the character or the intelligence of that person as being something that applies to everybody uh, within a specific group. Uh, Just like I realize that all white people are not uh, racist. That's uh, a foolish statement to to make. I uh, to give uh, Chuck a little information. I too, as a pastor, cling to my Bible and also cling to my uh, Smith and Weston. I'm a uh, concealed carry pastor. Uh, it is never a time, other than in the shower, that uh, my Smith and Weston is not nearby. So I I agree with you that on Chuck. Uh, with Chuck, um, the other uh, aspect too uh, is that uh, when. Racism is really, uh, it's, it's hard to say it doesn't exist when you don't exist in it. So what I mean by that is perception is reality to the person uh, that perceives it. Um, and so uh, to be an African-American male, uh, have I experienced racism in my life? Yes, uh, but um, self-image uh, and faith has been the things that I was able to overcome whatever obstacles uh, have been maybe uh, placed in my way. Um, to, to get a better perspective on it, I just want to give, share just two uh, inspirational days in my life that I never thought I would see happen based on racism. goes back to the uh, early 80s when Harold Washington was the first elected African-American mayor of Chicago um, prior to that I never thought uh, in my life that I would see African-American mayor of Chicago. 
because what happened when the first mayor of Daly died, there was a gentleman by the name uh, of uh, uh, Frost, Alderman Frost, who was the uh, the person in charge of the city council. And according to the um, uh, bylaws or, or the ordinances of Chicago uh, uh, gov- uh, city go- city council government, that in the absence of the uh, mayor, that the head of the city council would take that office. Uh, but the, the Chicago Police Department blocked him from going to the mayor's office. And so, again, I really didn't, you know, when, when Harold Washington became the mayor of Chicago, it was a day where I, I celebrated that, hey, you could be black and you could achieve anything. The next time it happened uh, was when I had the opportunity of shaking a young man's hand at that time, who was a, a state uh, senator running for senator, and his name was Barack Obama. And when when he became mayor, excuse me, when he became the president of the United States, first of all, he became the Democratic nominee. That was an amazing time. But when he actually won, I uh, called my mother, who at that time was uh, in her late 80s, and she was stunned that she would live to see the uh, first African-American uh, male or female, whatever, first African-American to become president of the United States. What happened after that, I celebrated the moment, but right after that, we started to see the underbelly of racism for whatever reason it was there. Uh, Some of that, I believe, is based on fear. But that's when, uh, as soon as uh, President Obama was elected, that's when we had people like our current president going around saying that uh, trying to delegitimize his presidency by saying he was not born in America. Uh, And uh, so so anybody, uh, and I have a hard time. As a pastor, I don't promote politics. I'm independent, but I just struggle with any African American that uh, just forgave that blatant disregard to uh, the legitimacy of the first African American president by our current president, and they just act like it wasn't a big deal and it wasn't based on racism. And you got to uh, understand him, and I don't have to understand anything except that was racism. He was a man who qualified to be the president. He was elected president, but they were trying to delegitimize him. During that time, uh, whether it was the Tea Party or hiding behind the principles of uh, of, of Republican Party, um, which I am, I'm anti-abortion. I I believe that every human has their own rights. Um, so forth and so on. I'm more conservative than, than I probably live. I'm liberal in areas and conservative in other areas. But the whole point is, is that uh, uh, what we thought was a time of celebration and liberation became a point of frustration for people who, A, were afraid that uh, if black people ever take power, they're gonna do to us what we did to them. And that's not been the case. Uh, B, uh, became a, a time of opportunity for people like carpetbaggers during the uh, reconstruction to take advantage of division. And uh, so there, there are people that have, been, uh, have made their political careers on division. And, um, there were my mother, for example, would go to uh, she attended a church out here in Aurora that was a predominantly white church. She's the only African American um, participant in the in a card party with the senior citizens, and she would listen to the people uh, call Michelle Obama a monkey, that monkey, and they 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 thought it was okay to say that in front of her, um, which is again uh, ridiculous. Uh, I would never call. Uh, any female, a monkey, let alone the first lady of the United States. So there were people that saw President Obama as uh, somebody else's president, not mine. Or even though I disagree with him often, President Donald J. Trump is my president. He's a, there's only one president at one time. So we have to recognize that. So but what uh, Obama's election, and, I, and I'll stop right there, Obama's election uh, be, became like a volcano for the recent surge, in my opinion, uh, Bridget, of racism. I'll stop there. Okay. So your take on racism um, is that in certain, there are certain opportunities that arise and then it just kind of, it's like a explosion. It, it just festers yeah. and it just goes on and on and on. And well, there's, um, I there's guess- many factors to it. You know, people in the South and the in the rural areas felt uh, that uh, they were forgotten by uh, political parties, especially the Democratic Party, want to call it that. 
and so they 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 used that as an you know and people took advantage of that to to um to drive home the the, the racist views that we're now dealing with okay so if you had one sentence that you could say what or try and define racism what would you define racism as in your opinion what is racism the, 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 the belief uh, in the worst of people that I don't really know at all. Okay. So that's going back to, you know, prejudging, prejudice. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mike, for that was very interesting. And I'll, uh, I'd like to chime in on some of your points uh, a little bit later. Sue, if you had to define racism, how would you define it? Uh, A combination of um, everybody's commentary. Prejudice, prejudgment, predetermination, preconception, uh, without really knowing much about anything that is really the definition of racism, let's say, that we're discussing today. Um, It is an emotional topic for myself because my family for generations has experienced um, ethnic discrimination. And um, I am actually, Bridget, a Serbian Orthodox from a minority town in Croatia. So we have been in World War I, World War II. Um, I lost my grandfather. He was a wise man of the village. And we were all white folk. And um, the partisans and the Chetniks, not getting too much into history, um, one of them killed him for imagining that he sided with a, with another. Uh, my grandmother buried um, soldiers. Uh, homes were occupied by the Nazis. And uh, civil war was tragic, which wiped out my hometown, which no longer exists. So me, myself, I guess, uh, I'm really choked up by this topic uh, to say when I came to this country in 1971, I think I told you this story. My best friend and first friend was an African-American girl at uh, Roosevelt Elementary School. My mother really feared that I would, you know, did not know the language would be um, not, you know, being able to fit in, so on and so forth. And I brought her home the second day. And I think this topic, you know, really starts at the roots, you know of your home base, which is for me, faith and uniting. And what my mother taught me was be kind to all people. And um, it's just uh, everything that Michael sums up basically. Um, But I'd say prejudgment, predetermination, preconception, and also a word that might not exist in the dictionary. I don't want to call it ignorance because I'm a very positive person, um, non-wisdom. And non-wisdom for me is not knowing, but placing commentary. I get that. I get that. That's, um, that was pretty eloquently put in your story, um, you know, in regards to the wars that your country experienced, um, being marginalized, Um, All of that is part of racism. And that's why it's important to talk about these subjects today. It not only happens uh, to the black community, um, it happens on a broad scale across the world. Um, It just so happens that um, black people by and large have been disproportionately marginalized and it's been systemic. and it runs through various institutions. And I could cite the research on those institutions that have um, done the work to find out just how systemic um, racism runs. Um, But, you know, that's for another show. What I want to talk about is just getting at the core of it. Um, I truly believe uh, that racism is taught I think that racism um, is perpetuated out of fear, anxiety, 
um, just not understanding other people. To your point, Sue, ignorance. Um, you cleaned it up very nice, but I have to call it what it is. Ignorance. And ignorance is simply, it simply means not knowing. You just don't know. So if you don't know what you don't know, you know, you lean to your own understanding and you move forward to, uh, through life in that regard. If you have a total community of that, then you've got ignorance on steroids. The only thing that that community is really understanding are themselves and their way of life. So for me, I would not dare presume what the Amish do on a daily basis and what their ideologies are. I'm not Amish. I didn't grow up in that community. But if they came to live next door to me, I wouldn't ostracize them or I don't think I would have the right to prejudge them based on what I see on television or what I've heard through other people. I would have to get to know my neighbor. And that's something that we don't do very well as a divided nation and sometimes as a very divided world. We don't get to know our neighbors. We don't get to know our cultures uh, that are so rich in ethnic beauty that we think that we're better than the next person. That's the superiority and the inferiority that comes with racism. So I'll give you guys an example of something that happened to me and I'll pose the question to you. When did you realize that, first realize that there were so many other people on the planet that were different than you? My experience was, I grew up in a diverse neighborhood, but it turned predominantly black. And so there were a few white people that went to school with me, grade school. And I got to know this one girl, Crystal, pretty well but I had preconceived notions based on what I saw on television and what other black people were saying about other white people. It was not until I went to college and I had a white roommate that I really got it. I really got it. And what I mean by that, my roommate was from a farm town in central Illinois. She had curly hair. It was tapered, um, short on the side, short in the back, really cute girl. And it was the first white person that I had ever seen with a big behind, a rear end. And so when I met her, I was like, wow, we wore the same type of stuff. She wore jeans, Levi's. I love my Levi's. I had a whole closet full of Levi's and sweaters and t-shirts. We dressed alike. My hair was short. I put a perm in it, it was curly, and I tapered, it was short in the back. And people used to say, you guys actually look alike. And I'm like, I think there is more kinship. We're more alike than we are different. She dated the quarterback, all my friends were on the football team. And it was like, wow, why is the world making such a big deal out of this being so different? It blew my mind that we're more alike than we are different. So I'm gonna ask you guys, is America racist?